Hello all. A quick check in with those in the Northern Hemisphere. Is it hot in here? June 2022 is seemingly an oven from Florida all the way up to Michigan, so I'm already reminiscing about the springtime in Ireland in April this year. And the first stop on our little tour was in Belfast with one of the kindest and most humble scientists we've ever met. As he mentions himself though, because AP is in an at-risk category for COVID, we all wore masks, so we hope you'll forgive us if the sound is sometimes a little muffled. Also, because we recorded in his lab, we got to play around with some fun giant plastic molecules. Check out our website, twoscientists.org, for pictures of said molecules. But now, on with the show and a little serendipity in chemistry. Hello, dear listeners. This is your host, Pam Weber, here with David Basanta, both of whom are very excited to be recording a Two Scientists episode outside the U.S., for the first time in a very long time. Today we have the pleasure of being at Queen's University at Belfast, where we are grateful to be speaking with Professor A.P. De Silva. How are you this lovely morning? I, well, as well as you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. So normally we would be recording in a bar or a restaurant somewhere, but uh, you requested that we pick somewhere that was a bit less public, because... COVID. Yeah, because, and I apologize for this, like I noticed from many of the shows that you've done before, you recorded in very live settings. So today you're having the most dead setting you oh, can Oh, not at all, not at all. But it is because I may be the most geriatric person on your show, <laughs> uh, which I'm very glad to be. So thank you, thank you very much for having me. But it just so happens with this pesky virus going around and with me being particularly prone to this yes uh, we can chat about it if you like and so because of that i've had to offer you this very sterile environment this is absolutely fun for me it's always a joy to go and visit other scientist labs so it's 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 exciting for me yeah this is a real place where actual experiments happen and i still am a sort of a get my hands dirty kind of scientist even at my extreme age. And so this is a place where many experiments have taken place. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, because I, I was a bit scared. I had to leave my cells behind to come here. And I asked my PI if I, he would do it. And he looked very, very dubious. So I had to get one of my colleagues to do it instead. <laughs> but for the audience, if they go and look up the photos associated with this particular episode, they'll see us dressed in our finery. Uh, it just so happens that today, thanks to our lack of time management, immediately after this recording, we'll be heading to the wedding of our dear friend uh, Arturo Araujo, um, who is fellow co-founder of this podcast and the artist who designed our logo, no less. But yes, so AP, maybe you're a little disappointed to find out that we don't dress this fancily for all our guests. <laughs> <laughs> But it's such a lovely chance then to catch both of you at a time when you're looking your shiniest. Oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. Not everybody gets to see us this nicely. Privilege. <laughs> but let's start the podcast by talking about your background, because you are originally from Sri Lanka. How does one move from there to Northern Ireland and what inspired you to go into science in the first place? Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, for me, I've been Mr. Accidents all along. <laughs> so for me, I suppose the story really started in Sri Lanka where my grandfather, I knew only one grandfather, and he was a primary school teacher. And he was also the person who would introduce literacy to all the children in our little town. As you know, in some parts of the world, literacy is highly valued. Mm -hmm. um, like I grew up in very poor circumstances, but in, even in those circumstances, it was always realized that education is the way that you can make something of yourself. And therefore, literacy is held in very high regard. Mm -hmm. In fact, literacy has an initiation ceremony in Sri Lanka. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's quite unusual. Like I've chatted with people from around the world and very few societies seem to have that. And in Sri Lanka, we are lucky that uh, the two large, largest communities in Sri Lanka both have mm -hmm. literacy ceremonies. And my grandfather used to conduct these initiations in our little house. Mm -hmm. And so I had the pleasure of seeing this since I was a baby. And so it was a great inspiration. You see youngsters being brought to be introduced 
to language before you go to school mm -hmm. so to write basically yeah and to read and so it's a real precious thing it's where the the teacher takes the writing hand of the child mm -hmm. in the writing hand of that person and then at a selected time they would write out the first character of the alphabet and say it out loud and the child would repeat and I have seen this it's absolutely magical uh -huh. and from that moment on the parents who are also present know that their child has a chance in life that's so beautiful oh it's beautiful no less no less and so I used to see this as a child mm -hmm. and then following from that I could see that my grandfather even though we were very poor that he had R-E-S-P-E-C-T yeah you know people around yeah. feel that he's the one who would take their child by the hand in this yep. way and start them out in life mm -hmm. and then as people grow older they would remember that this is the man who gave them that gateway and so I was always interested therefore in uh, teaching and learning mm -hmm. and so of course research now that I do is learning yes and I get the chance to share it with others and that's the teaching and they teach me too and so this cycle is what I'm involved in now. Yeah. Uh, coming to Belfast, of course, was again accidental. Uh -huh. As you can imagine, because Sri Lanka was a small place, at the, and at that time Sri Lanka was quite peaceful, unlike in more recent times. Yeah. But because we were a small place, we did not have sufficient teachers in the university. But we were an old British colony, mm -hmm. and therefore the Sri Lankan government would appeal to the British government, you got us into this situation, we don't have enough teachers, will you send us some? Yep. And of course they did. And I'm sure you know about the British Council, mm -hmm. it's the cultural arm of the British government. Yep. And so they sent a teacher to our university to teach chemistry. He, he came for one year and he stayed for 20. So he became a national institution more uh -huh. or less. And then it so happened that before he came to Sri Lanka, he had worked in a big pharmaceutical company here, ah. which of course is GSK now. Yes. At that time they were known as Glaxo. Glaxo, yes. Yeah. And so while he was teaching there, he had looked after a young boy who was washing the bottles in the lab. Mm -hmm. And this person rose to be the professor of chemistry in Queen's University, Belfast, here. And of course, at the time, at the time we finished off our bachelor's degrees, and I was looking to do postgraduate work somewhere. And of course, nobody would take us because we are from a small place in Sri mm -hmm. Lanka, and we were just used to rejection. And then a friend of mine, who is a musician, a better musician than me, I must say, <laughs> happened to be reading a British cultural magazine in which there was an advertisement for PhD places for foreign students uh -huh. in Queen's University ah, okay. in this school of chemistry and, and chemical engineering and the advertiser was this professor so this is the happy accident and yes. as you know Sri Lanka is where the word serendipity comes from oh. yeah actually happy I did accident. not know that yes, yes. happy accidents and so when this advertisement was shown to our teacher, mm -hmm. he just laughed and said, that's my student. <laughs> so I'll tell him to take you all. And so my friend came here first and I was the third guy to come here. That's a tremendous story. Ah, it's, this is what you call accidents. <laughs> Wonderful yeah. accidents. But it's also because my friend who was a chemist as well, mm -hmm. but he was a musician. So that's why he was reading this cultural magazine. And then that our professor had advertised everywhere because he was desperate because there was a war here. So foreign yes. students would not come. Mm -hmm. mm. So he was desperate to get people. Yeah. And we were really keen on finding out what is this chemistry thing. Yes. And so that was the chance for us all. So it's happiness all around really. Absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, speaking of chemistry, organic chemistry is potentially not one of the sexier subjects. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I think, it, uh, again, as again, I'm sure you're aware, Pambir and David as well, chemistry has always had bad press. So, chemistry as a subject isn't sexy. Like, yep. even if you think of molecules, the atoms put together in patterns which are all over us, mm -hmm. if you ask anyone on the street, they will say, oh, DNA. 
So molecular biology has hijacked that, if you like. <laughs> yeah. And again there, I was really blessed with a high school teacher who taught me chemistry and many generations of Sri Lankans. And one of the messages he got across to us was, chemistry is something that is part of what we touch and feel and breathe. And I think that was quite important for me at the time to realize that chemistry is as real as it gets. <laughs> like for example, like I love astronomy type subjects, but it's all far away. Mm -hmm. But they have very good press officers. Yes. Chemistry has somehow failed over the years. And so again, I'm very grateful to both of you for doing things like this because you are the true ambassadors for the subject. Because chemists, working chemists, like you are a working neuroscientist, and David is a working mathematical biologist. But in chemistry, the problem has been the contact with the media has been very poor. Mm -hmm. Why? You could analyze that further if you like, because chemistry is very real. Yeah. Chemistry is very applied and therefore chemistry engages with all our lives very strongly. But when it does, it comes into the hand of business people who then obviously have other priorities and yeah. then mistakes will happen. And when the mistakes happen, there is no one then to take the blame except the original chemists. That is my feeling and again I've discussed this with journalists like yourself and many of them felt that chemical for example is such a bad word now. Yes. On the other hand we tend to think of chemistry even in songs and lyrics we talk of chemistry as a field between people. So the word chemical is in the dust yep. and several of those journalists suggested to me earlier that maybe we should replace the word chemical now with molecule and then make a case for it. Yes. And which I'm delighted to do and to feel that I am just a plastic bag full of molecules <laughs> with a few bones stuck in the middle and that's me. And all those molecules inside me are able to be choreographed like the best of, say, like a concert situation. Mm -hmm. And they keep me as me. Yeah. For example, I'm sure it's popular around the world, like L'Oreal would advertise cosmetics to people by saying you're worth it. And yes. But that worth comes from this plastic bag full of molecules. So yes. Then molecules can't be bad. And so for me, the feeling has been if there's something I can do to make a person's life happy. And luckily, I have had the pleasure. Yep. And we can chat a bit more about that. And what that enabled us to do is to make molecules to serve this plastic bag full of molecules, which is us. Yes. So then chemistry becomes inescapable. And then I suppose it gets as sexy as all people can. <laughs> but somehow that message was missed over the years. And of course now, I think even some of these journalists I'm thinking of, they tried to rephrase the old chemistry language in terms of life itself. Yes, yes rather than industry, which is maybe one of the mistakes made by the early chemists. Mm. For example, in the late 1950s, certainly in the UK, for example, they talked of the white heat of industry. Mm -hmm. And a large part of that industry happened to be chemistry. So out of that came a big credit at the time, but mm -hmm. then the bad things all piled up and they were laid at the, at the door of the chemical industry at the time. For example, Again, this is something from the past. There was a huge corporation called Imperial Chemical Industries, mm -hmm. and they are dead now. I mean, it does have all of the magic words that would make you want to load something, exactly. right? Exactly. All three letters yes. are bad news now. Of course, now they have transformed into other forms, and I think AstraZeneca have mm. some parts of it. But you're quite right. You can't get three worse words in a title anymore. <laughs> So chemists have shot themselves in both feet and both hands. Really. Yes. Yeah. So it's, I know we, we've been talking about this, David and I, as um, that science and scientists have branding issues. And yes. we didn't discover that until maybe the last five years or oh, so. Okay. Until like more people have been doing science communication. Yes. And it never occurred to me. But you're right. Chemical is a bad word. Molecule is a good word. It's a good word. At once it is explained because again, one of the joys of coming from the East where spiritual things are important and religion plays a large part and 
So, for example, molecules to me now remind me of ghosts. Of course, many industrialized people will say, oh, now that's very unscientific topic you're on. But my feeling would be that it's very much part of the human experience. And mm. as we go back in time, it played an even larger role. Maybe as time goes on, these things will disappear. Yep. But there's plenty of people who watched the film Poltergeist and who were scared out of their wits. Yes. <laughs> so it still has an influence on us. And I would use that word measured, ghost. Like mm -hmm. a ghost is something you can't see, yeah. but it has an influence on you for sure. Yeah. Molecules are like that. Mm. And of course, in this case, it's really scary in a way because the, this ghost lives inside me, yes. all inside me. Yes. So I can't get away from it. And these are nice ghosts. <laughs> and they are the ones when you pile them all together, squillions of them together, suddenly there is you. So a small part of me is this thing we call a molecule. Yep. And the molecule is just a pretty pattern of those atoms, yep. which again were talked about by old philosophers, old religions. In fact, Buddhism talks about this and Hinduism has ideas of this. And so we are touching real human experience then. So for me, there aren't two cultures really. Yeah. I think science, as again, as Pambir, you know from the old languages, uh, one of the old, like the Sanskrit kind of meaning, vidya, used to mean just knowing, knowing, yeah. that's it. So science wasn't separate from everything else in society. So that's why, again, the function that you, Pamir and David, you are doing now is really vital. It is like making the two cultures become one again. That's what a medium does, even with ghosts, you know. So I think that's where uh, chemistry to me now as you mentioned, like the sexiness of it should be as the same as the sexiness you'd find in people. Yeah. There's no real separation. And actually, I mean, I think what potentially biologists forget when they're doing their work is that what you're talking about is so oh, yeah. fundamental to ours. Oh, like, yeah. um, I'm actually trained in pharmacology. Yes. And that's how molecules affect the body. Yes, that's very literally much so. what the study is. Very and much so. On top of that, you have entire new fields that are trying to create life yes. from scratch. Exactly. And how do you do that without Starting chemistry? Starting with the individual yes. molecules. Again, if I may give a musical example, I think chemists in many ways are like bass players. We uh -huh. are like basses, where we stand in the background, we get, get alongside the drummer and keep things going. And we are only noticed in a jazz setting where suddenly <laughs> the trumpet player will say, come on up and do your solo. and this guy in the dark suddenly steps out into the spotlight, does a few things and then steps back again and then life just flows on. So chemistry has very much been that. So as you say, biology tends to forget it. And now I find computer science tends to forget it mm -hmm. because I, again, I'm very fortunate to be dabbling in these the disciplines from medicine across to computer science. Again, the computer scientists, when we have discussions like they would say, real information processing and computing belongs to us, the industry. And these were some of the, the limits of computation people at IBM that I'm thinking of. When we first started to show molecules were computing, those people, I mean, they are wonderfully clever people, earned billions for the companies. and They refuse to believe that we have computing capabilities inside. I just couldn't understand why they didn't. I suppose to them the feeling was to be computing you must have a box, mm -hmm. something you can sell, a piece of technology. Mm -hmm. And I would again offer as a discussion point with your listeners and yourselves, the real information technology is not what we buy in a box out of Radio Shack or places. The real information technology is what you see in the mirror yourself because when we live we are continuously taking information and we are computing it and then using it to prosper. What better useful technology, what useful knowledge can there be? Yeah. Technology being a useful knowledge. So I suppose again, the way the world works, we have been taken down that commercial road alone rather than saying, if people have prospered all these years by using the information around them, Surely that is IT. <laughs> that is my little feeling. I, again, I don't think many people subscribe to that. 
But then again, I would remind them when I'm walking down the street and if I didn't notice the bus coming towards me, I'll be dead, dead. And how am I alive now? Because I saw the bus, I heard the bus and I avoided it. I took in information and mm -hmm. used it to prosper. That's IT for me. Yeah. And also given the, the number of terms that are floating around like neural networks ah, within the field, like yeah. how you can have that detachment Without, is very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that's again part of the, I suppose, the splits that occur even within science. The engineers tend to feel it's only an engineered product that can be useful. So for me, I suppose the connection will come back to humanity every time. Yeah, so you've, you've now started to touch upon the fact that your research is not just one thing. You are clearly working across many, many disciplines. And I'm going to read this out just because <laughs> in isolation, I understand what these terms mean, but maybe as a paragraph, you're going to have to explain all of this to me. So you talk about how with your co-workers, you introduce this concept of molecular logic as an experimental field. Yeah. and later established the luminescent PET, so that's photo-induced electronic transfer, a sensing switching tool, and that you also use chemistry in kind of developing tools for like this blood gas electrolyte analyzer, which is, you know, has a very applied oh, yeah, uh, yeah. use within medicine. Yeah. So, Tell us about your research, <laughs> except do so in a way by I can, where I can understand the, oh, don't the you different worry. elements. Oh, I think <laughs> you have IQ to burn, and because I very much come from the the point of view that uh, I am foolish in many many ways, but that <laughs> saved me many a time because then I listen, 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 and if someone is willing to teach me things, I am more than happy to take it in. And so, like as I mentioned earlier, like uh, this wonderful chemistry teacher in high school who switched me on to this chemistry being something that is very human in that way. And so, once it's very human, then any human enterprise should come within it. So, the remit is as wide as people can be. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was just these lovely opportunities where people would come along and say, let's do something. For example, there was in the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka where we studied. And then I was very fortunate because our university was very small that we got to know people from various disciplines. So one of my dearest friends, I still see him every time I go to Sri Lanka, he was a physicist. I like physics, but chemistry was my major. But then when we are playing a bit of basketball badly <laughs> and then when you're cooling off afterwards he would tell stories about what he does and many of our other friends would say oh shut up we are, <laughs> we are just cooling off here we don't want to hear science uh -huh. and this guy would want to talk about what he's doing for physics and I would just tell him tell me and I was more than happy to listen so he was the first person who introduced me to real logic gates, which mm -hmm. are now used in all computers. Yeah. So once I was interested, he would tell me, come across to our lab and I'll show you. So he allowed me to work with my own hands. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just absolute like toy shop uh -huh. because I had never seen these things. And this was like in the 1980s, so mm -hmm. before computers were common. And so he showed me these things with which you could build a clock, for example, and keep time. And so while I was studying chemistry in bits and pieces, I was picking up little bits of physics along the way. And this friend showed me the power of some of these things. And then it took me ages in my little head slowly for it to suddenly dawn on me that, oh, oh these logic gates, can we ever make them with molecules? It took me a long time. And that happened here. Yeah. in Queen's Belfast itself. So that's how I was able to do the transition from chemistry slowly. I'm a real <laughs> tortoise kind of uh -huh. person. Eventually to say molecules can maybe connect with computers. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have the knowledge even though people had talked up, up till then like people are molecular. So yeah. if people can 
do information handling in like neuroscientist you you know at the highest level then somehow molecules are able to do that but there were no experimental ways of doing it at that time mm -hmm. so it was very much dreamland and then and next year is the 30th anniversary so you come at a really particular time uh, and so here then eventually we were able to build some molecules in a lab which could work as logic gates like out of your phone or mm -hmm. out of your computer can you explain very quickly what a logic gate oh, is? Oh yeah, with pleasure. And again, maybe I can make a little connection with one of the greatest scientists in all Ireland called George Boole. Mm -hmm. Boolean methods mm -hmm. comes from this man. And so he was from England and he was a mathematician, but he had an interest in classical languages. Mm -hmm. So again, this thing of not making two cultures uh, was a real development there because and then he came to Ireland at the time of the Great Famine, the Great Hunger. And mm -hmm. so there were three Queen's Colleges at the time. Mm -hmm. Belfast was one. One was in the very south of Ireland, in Cork. And there was another one in the west, in Galway. So these were the three colleges and they were advertising for staff. Mm -hmm. He was across England. He had just qualified as a mathematician. And he applied for a job and our university for some reason didn't take him <laughs> and he went down to Cork and God bless Cork and there was where he started thinking languages are ways in which you transfer information. He's a mathematician and then he realized that languages can be structured in such a way that you make questions to which the answer can only be yes or no. Mm -hmm. As we know, lawyers do this for a living, yep. a good living. And so they will <laughs> pin you down and say, now tell me yes or no. That was the binary choices. Mm -hmm. And so out of these binary choices, George Boole was the guy who said, languages can be built out of zero and one only. So true or false, he replaced by mathematical symbols. Yep. And then he said, if you have mathematical symbols, I can manipulate numbers like everybody else does. Yeah. And so he was the true revolutionary. And again, I'd like to point out, he did that in a time of a famine, in a time of great crisis. Mm -hmm. And then he came up with this discovery. And then his students then realized, we can now manipulate these numbers. So that's, so George Boole didn't invent logic, but he invented the binary system. Yep. And then his students said, now let's do logic. And as you know, a logic means stepwise operations of anything. So in languages, we will use that to communicate in slow steps. Mm -hmm. If we don't use slow step, I am either mad or drunk or a poet. <laughs> so James Joyce kind of person would be the guy doing the big leaps. Yes. Yes. And we don't understand him even now. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so steps, little steps. And then once you had the binary system with only these two numbers, then the steps were the smallest possible. So for example, that discovery nearly 30 years ago that we were able to make was to emulate an AND logic gate. And so what's an AND logic gate? An AND logic gate is where two signals come in. Mm -hmm. So the signals can be anything. Again, if I give you a musical example from choirs, it would be a call and response. Mm -hmm. So the choir master or the lead soloist puts a line and then the other people come in. And suddenly you have a gospel situation mm -hmm. de developing out of that. So just like a call response, a computer or a phone or molecules as we would use, also use this system of call and response, which is inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. yep. And then the moment we use inputs and outputs, we tend to use the word signal because it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. and just like in a call response, you just sing your note and then you wait for the other person to sit yep. back. And so uh, and logic gate was two calls have to come at the same time and then a response will emerge. Otherwise, it remains quiet. So logic gates have a little bit of cleverness, if you will. Yeah. But they are basically looking for a condition. And yeah. unless the condition applies, they remain silent. And only when the condition applies, you get the signal. So these AND logic gates were then two signals come at the same time and then you give a response or otherwise you don't. And of course, this is a very powerful phenomenon, this AND logic function. It's not stuck in a lab at all. For example, 
here you are going to a wedding. Why are you going to a wedding? Because two people have decided that if they are together, they are going to be happier. Or if you take the old line, united we stand, divided yep. we fall. So it's wonderful that you are going to the wedding. And it's because I think love between people is one of the best examples of end logic. Mm -hmm. Where when two are there, something happens. Mm -hmm. And if it's only one or none, nothing happens at all. And so because of it, it's a very, like it's from our gut, really, mm. that even and logic originates. And that's why companies and political parties everywhere will use the line United in some kind of way. Here you are representing United States. And this idea of union has always been behind social animals. And yeah. So that's and logic all along. And so we were able to do that case first. And because it was a bit of a celebrity because of this, mm -hmm. because of its connection with society in general, because couples come from their families come from their villages, towns, cities, yep. clans entirely. And so because of that, we were in the happy situation then to get that little breakthrough there. And of course, with molecules, then you will ask, where's the call? Where's the response? And then again, it's wonderful that it's you, Palmbeer, who's interviewing because you are the neuroscientist, so you're very used to signals going along nervous systems. And so now I am very much lower down the pecking order where we are just taking molecules floating around in solution like a little goldfish. So, for example, this is again where thinking of the molecule as a pattern of atoms became very useful to us. Because again, if you think of it as a ghost, then how do you talk to the ghost? Mm -hmm. The ghost will scare you like hell, but then you've got to make a response <laughs> to try and take it away. And so with molecules, it's easy to do it with another molecule or atom, mm -hmm. because they're all the same size. We are just too big. So it's wonderful to arrange a stage on which the molecules can play. And then we watch from a distance and try to get some kind of phone call from them. So we tend to use light as this medium. So we use this fluorescent idea, like a fluorescent light in our little room here, and like a day glow jacket someone would mm -hmm. wear, which is light talking to us all. The light yep. is coming from some source. And then as you know, fluorescence then means for the light to come from that place, you got to supply some light from somewhere yep. else so that the energy is transformed in some kind of way. So fluorescence always has this power to communicate with small things. You shine light in the direction of the molecule. The molecule absorbs that light. So let's say you shine blue light at something which can absorb that blue light. And then it replies by sending, say, a green light signal. So suddenly, I am able to talk to the animals like Sammy Davis Jr. Is <laughs> and so now suddenly we can talk with the molecule. And then we've got to tell or instruct the molecule, if you like, when to send the signal back mm -hmm. and when not to send the signal back. And then here again, we were using something so human. We all depend on agriculture. And as you know, agriculture starts with photosynthesis, yep. where light forms, falls on the green plant and makes starch for us to eat and oxygen for us to breathe. And so there is that near religious powerful phenomenon. We are using the same phenomenon because it starts by light falling on the chloroplast and then a little chlorophyll molecule in there will shunt a little electron, these tiny things from which electricity came and electronics came, to go from one place to another. This is photo-induced electron transfer. So agriculture starts with this pet. And so that is what we use for a much less grand application, but it's still useful because now we can get the molecule to use up the light energy because it's using the light energy to start a bit of agriculture kind of thing. So then it has no energy to send back as a light signal. That's our trick. So we use agriculture basically to hijack mm. the molecule. So the molecule has no light to come to us. So this has multiple uses. You can use this directly to measure things. And I can give an example in a little while. But then for our logic purpose, 
it switches a light signal off and on. So whenever the agriculture happens, it's as black as night. When you stop that process in some way, then the light shines at me and I recognize it as a high signal. Yep. Or if it was like a choir, you hear a lovely voice in your ear. So that's how we were able to talk with the molecules. But then you will quite rightly ask as a scientist, how do we get our fingers into this molecule and tell it when to shine light or not? Yep. So it's through this electron transfer. Mm. But then electrons, as we are well used to in school, electrons have an electric charge. That's yep. why you can get electrocuted and get killed. This charge is, happens to be a minus charge. It's a negative charge. Mm -hmm. We tend to use, for example, a metal atom. And if you remove an electron from it, then you'll get metal ions like sodium chloride, sodium in salt, yep. which is used in our nervous systems. They are not metal atoms themselves. They are metal atoms stripped of an electron. Mm -hmm. So they are positive in charge. And this is wonderful because when a metal is positive, if it's close to an electron which plans to leave, it suddenly quotes Tina Turner and says, <laughs> opposites attract. <laughs> and so the electron doesn't leave. In other words, electron transfer, this photo-induced electron transfer, is controllable by Viva or controllable by Miss Turner. <laughs> it's controllable by opposites attract. So if you bring a metal ion close to this electron which tries to move, it doesn't go. And if it doesn't go, the energy is not used up to do agriculture. And so the light comes out in your face, your face, my face, David's <laughs> face. And so this is what makes this really powerful. So notice we can do two things now. We can get signals from this ghostly underworld, which is all parts of us. So you can watch for players of life. So that's the medicine use. And at the same time now, we can command and control these little molecules. That's where the switching comes. And that is where the computing happens. And so then we can give molecular examples of something that happens in a computer mm -hmm. or even something that happens in us as people. Yeah. So this molecular logic then was done by taking a molecule and giving it two places to receive two metal ions. Why? They, just like in the neuroscience, a metal ion can be captured in a place like when sodium potassium signals go down our nerves they are being held and released held and yep. released so we can make those little ones in the lab and i'm very grateful david that you filmed some of the little plastic toys on the table <laughs> i think that might be helpful to some of the listeners later mm -hmm. when they are taking a look at a photo uh, we can make molecules with big holes in them and so if i may point out later on so, for example, here is a molecule with a huge hole in it. Molecules with holes in them is the beginning of neuroscience, really. So, like the potassium channel and the more famous yes, one. Yes. So, this is a, not a channel, really, but it's certainly a big hole. Mm -hmm. And so, it's atom, it's a pattern of atoms. One atom, one atom, one atom, you join them all together and make like a necklace nearly big enough to put our heads in. Yeah. And then, comes this idea of, again, it's wonderful that you're going to a wedding. So here you are having lovely suits, suits which fit you because you're going to a wedding. Here is a molecule, if you like, which is a suit again, which fits another guy. And so this guy can go inside it. So, so here is one of our very recent ones. This, this was only published uh, five weeks ago. So I'm delighted to show uh -huh. you. Yeah. So, but there are many ex examples like this. In fact, like one of the early Nobel Prizes for this field called supramolecular chemistry. Mm -hmm. It just basically means a molecule which is a bit of a superwoman or a superman. <laughs> so then it's capable of catching another molecule. So here we are just catching a very special molecule containing a ruthenium, which is a very famous metal and it's used in a lot of catalysts. And so that's this guy here and it fits into here. So this idea of a tailored fit, yep. which people have been used to in clothes, yep. 
And of course, as you know, in enzymology, it was very popular, the lock and key thing. Mm -hmm. But I prefer the tailoring of clothes like Gucci, or, because <laughs> that's what most people would relate to. And so this is one of those cases. So our and logic gates were made by something like this, to receive a metal arm. So here it's more than a metal arm, it's a bigger thing. But to catch the tower. Yep. So our end logic gate was built with two holy places, uh -huh. <laughs> like one to catch one metal and then on the other side it has another hand. Mm -hmm. And each of these reads Tina Turner and says, okay, the moment I catch the metal iron, I'll stop an electron from leaving. So, when, so this molecule had two sides. Mm -hmm. Each side was capable of hijacking the light. Mm. And now we attack the hijacker in both places mm -hmm. and finally the light is released mm -hmm. when both arrive. So this was, and it's wonderful that we can chat over this now, 30 years ago, this was then the start of saying here, molecules are now able to emulate some of the properties of the silicon revolution. And then it's gone from there and now some of the actions we can do now are actual human emulation. So these little molecules in a run-down lab that you see here are able to behave like you, Pandey, like you. So you have a very kind of, a very lovely and poetic way of talking about your research. But when we're looking around your lab, it feels like the actual experiments you do are probably not as dramatic. Of course, oh, we are full of failure. Like, oh, my, again, my middle name will be failure. <laughs> I'm thinking less of the failure and more of the, like the, the array of chemicals that you have yes. means that the practical side of it is probably very simple. Or I don't want to simplify, but... Well, well, you're right. I think once we learn how to do it, it becomes very simple. Yep. And again, if I give the example of, again, we were very fortunate to have a lovely application. Like this little plastic chip here is the blood analyzer. So what this does is you can take a little bit of blood out of any of us and yeah. then the blood goes in here and then as you see it's got a big little channel. It's got a little channel going all the way around and there are these six spots here. Mm -hmm. Each of these spots will be a piece of paper, basically filter paper mm -hmm. that we use in high schools basically. Yeah. But as you see they are black and they are black because uh, the, we have connected the dye, just like fancy clothes, really. Yeah. So, for example, this corner one might be looking for sodium only. Yeah. So, it's got a hole fitting sodium, it's tailored for sodium. Then the next one is tailored for potassium in blood. Mm. And the next one is calcium in blood. Mm. So, this is the chip that is used around the world. And again, for your listeners, they can just do this at home. Uh, they can just browse on their phone for optimedical.com. Mm -hmm. It's a spin-out from Roche the Giant. Yeah. And they had a problem to solve and then they had looked around a few of the journals and yeah. thankfully they had read one of our little papers. You know, normally it's only my mommy who reads my paper. <laughs> but in this case, thankfully, the Roche scientists saw it and they came here. And so they had the commercial will and they made it into a product and it's made minimum of half a billion dollars so far that I know of for this wow. plastic chip. And that's, I mean, the accountants won't tell me what happened now because <laughs> I was consulting for a while yep. and now they don't need me anymore. So, and now this is off patent, so it's made in generics now. And so this is used everywhere, Pambir. And again, if I can give you an example, uh, this was used during the civil war in Sri Lanka by the ambulance crews. And I remain grateful and every time I go, oh, I think about it, you know, because we lost 100,000 lives in Sri Lanka in the civil war. And so the way the ambulance guys use it is the, the chip comes in this little foil pack kind of thing. And all they do is they go up to the person who they are treating, say it's AP minus a hand, yes. because I've just been in a suicide bombing situation. Mm -hmm. And then they'll take a little blood out of the hand and they'll put it into here. And this goes into a little box, yeah. maybe like a laptop kind of thing. And then in 30 seconds, it will read out the sodium and it will count the sodium that is present in my blood. And this is really crucial. And I didn't know it until these scientists told me. They phone the hospital and they tell the hospital, we are going to bring AP minus his hand. Yeah. And you're going to patch him out. 
And so they have, and of course, they have lost a lot of blood. And so then they prepare a blood bag with the correct amount of sodium. Because otherwise, people have different levels of sodium, like yep. different everything. And so if you transfuse the blood with the wrong level of sodium, you're traumatized anyway, mm. and you get shocked and you die. Yeah. And those salt shock doesn't happen anymore because of this. Nice. Ah, I remain grateful, you know. So it was a wonderful situation where this is used around the world now in many situations, like even that last time in the Ebola epidemic, for example, frontline dads were using these for the initial screens, for example. Yeah. So we were very fortunate, again, to land in hard medicine mm -hmm. because Roche noticed something we had written. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you know, the way you've spoken about my neuroscience background yeah. makes it sound a lot cleverer than it is, but yeah. the idea that you could produce something that you know has had a tangible impact oh, God, on people's yes. lives must be yeah, tremendous. Ah, yeah. oh, it is a wonderful feeling. Like, for example, in Sri Lanka, when I visit, hope oh, this virus will relent and I'll be able to go again, is, of course, sometimes on the street you see people with injuries who have recovered now, of course, and I then think to myself, are you one who was saved with this? Yeah. Because it was so, because as you know, suicide bombings, like you're standing at a bus stop and suddenly you go boom and 50 people disappear. And so, of course, Northern Ireland had its own issues, which yeah. I was used to, but they were not suicide bombings. Yeah. And so things like this suddenly again brought the humanity of science to me again. And so I feel very fortunate that Rosh chose, like you chose to come. <laughs> Thank you again. And Rosh chose to come. And because they chose to come and then we were able to discuss and and again, I remember them telling me, we don't need you, but we want you. Yeah. <laughs> because, because I'm foolish enough to publish. <laughs> As scientists, we do this. We write about what we have discovered. And so that's how Roche participated. So I was very fortunate there, on the one hand, to think about computer science things, of which I have no massive application to give you. Though I offered it to Rush, but Rush said, oh, hold on. <laughs> we are happy with this. We don't want to make it complicated. So we'll keep it like this. But even there, there was a relevance maybe we can discuss here. In fact, uh, this became quite important after the Boston bombings. Uh, because at that time, I was very fortunate that a friend of mine in Tufts University, yep. he did a couple of trials with the Massachusetts General Hospital for situations of possible bioterrorism. Mm. using an idea from here. What you saw is we are measuring sodium alone in one spot, yeah. those black spots you saw, and then potassium in the next spot. Of course, in the box it can all be measured, <laughs> but what they wanted was a quick and dirty screen. So at that time, we, I remember we used the word epidemic mm -hmm. as a situation where health services will be under pressure. So you can't all go to the hospital, mm -hmm. but you should be able to do something quick outside the hospital. And so the Mass General, what they did is they ran a trial assuming what would happen if there was bioterrorism yeah. where the terrorist is not carrying a gun or a bomb, but the person is just ill, mm -hmm. deliberately made ill. Mm -hmm. So people had thought of these things and they was grateful to participate in some of these discussions. And then what they imagined is, imagine a person, so the Boston bombing made it real, real at the time, because then you imagine somebody just riding a subway up and down, up and down and coughing. Yeah. Yeah. And that person does as much damage as someone with a bomb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what the trial they ran was somebody with TB who is going to infect half of Boston kind of thing. So they did a trial for and logic to look for two things. Yeah. So in that trial, what they tried to do was to imagine somebody with TB and then they wanted to see, they were thinking of this false positive situation, which we are so used to now. Yes. So they wanted to see mm -hmm. a person may have, say on their yeah. body somewhere, they have the TB bacterium has landed. But then they looked for an interleukin response mm -hmm. from the person. Then the person is perhaps in yeah. fact. Oh. So they were looking for like a blood test situation where you're looking for is the bug there and is the response there? So maybe you are likely yeah. to be ill. And if you got a positive from that, then that person should be tested more rigorously yeah. by a medical person. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful they tried that. 
So at that time we called it a lab on a molecule. Mm-hmm. Like this lab on a chip yeah. kind of idea. Yeah. So the lab on a molecule was where the molecule performs almost all the functions. So it's a bit like a pregnancy test now or yeah. a lateral flow test now. Yeah. Where the testing is done by everything is done on the chip basically. Mm-hmm. So that was again something which didn't go as far as this electrolyte analyzer I showed you now, but it has the chance to do that because it's all laid out, it's all published there now. So these are some of the pleasures I've had to take a little bit of chemistry to human situation. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I have to say it makes me a bit jealous. Yes. <laughs> for for people good. who do much more kind of, at least in our case, very basic science these days. And we were talking earlier before we started the podcast about the fact that you obviously you need some degree of funding to be able to carry out science and how do we translate this value into something that people are going to appreciate that we need funding for because I think a lot of people think that oh philanthropy is going to fix this which they have no idea that that money is a drop in the bucket. Which is true. Yeah I can only give you my little experiences for this palm beer which was that uh, like in the Sri Lankan context where all these ideas seeded really, we had absolutely no support. Meaning there were no government funding agencies at the time, and this was in the mid 80s now, to remind you how old I am. But at that time there were no resources except what was in a teaching laboratory. Mm. Meaning the university had a role, a responsibility to educate the population and so they had to buy in chemicals if you like to use the word which are there to train people to do chemistry and then go around the world really is what happened but when they do that these are labs which have some funding from government nothing else and then of course the biggest wealth we had in Sri Lanka was bright people who were enthusiastic because they again believed in this principle that education was something which is valuable because you can do things with it later. For example, if you were poor, you will be less poor. And so this drive was present within people. And so then the basic needs for small scale research, as I tried to mention, mine is that even now the essentials were there. So for example, I would just go and ask friends in other universities, do you happen to have this particular chemical? Mm -hmm. And they would have a bottle and they would gladly give it to me. (laughs) Because otherwise it would be just sitting there. Yeah. And so they felt we are not using it for our teaching classes and you have a need for it, go ahead. And I even had cases of, it so happened, there was a Sri Lankan scientist who helped in analyzing the moon rocks from the Mm. Apollo program. And he worked at the University of Maryland. Yeah. And so whenever he would come to Sri Lanka, he would bring things in his bags. <laughs> so there were little things like this, like we would tell a story. So nowadays you would call it a pitch for fun. Yes. <laughs> they are just chatting like we are now. And then those people would say, yeah, I think I can find that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, this guy had his own funds from the National Science Foundation in America. And this was a few dollars and he would just bring a couple of little bottles for me. Mm-hmm. Now, nowadays you couldn't do that, maybe with drug situations yeah, yeah, yeah. and he brought these for me. And then along with these wonderfully, really enthusiastic young folks, then we could get together and somehow get it to some level of function. And then I'm very grateful that some of those were published then and with difficulty of course. In fact, like the Royal Society of Chemistry editors used to laugh at me later saying, APV, remember your handwritten manuscripts? Uh-huh. Because that's all I had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was telling my story as best as I could. And so science for me has always been a very sticks and ceiling wax kind of enterprise. Yeah. It was very <laughs> low scale. But then when we have the philosophical platform, which I very much trusted, mm. like this is worthwhile. So it's almost a sense of mission, you know, yep. like that something valuable can come out of this. Maybe not like I never dreamt we will have a blood analyzer, yep. but I would have dreamt that this science will be useful knowledge. Mm-hmm. That was it. So it goes back to my grandfather really. So it's in that way that Sri Lanka worked with zero resources, you might say, but we had this most valuable resource of all, it's like wonderful people who were committed, mm. who were willing to do things. 
And in Northern Ireland, I found the same all over again. Again, it was a war situation. And then there were these wonderfully talented people who, were, who chose to come. So it was really wonderful. And then the government at the time had this policy that we must put aside some money for tertiary education. Mm -hmm. Now, that's been degraded since that time. Yeah. But over the years, I've been very grateful for the 30, 35 or so people who chose to do their PhDs with me. And, mm -hmm. so, and that was the level of funding. And so we are sometimes helped by philanthropy type of organizations like mm -hmm. most recently the Unilever Foundation. There's a Lever Hume Trust in yeah. the UK. And so they helped me for this most recent program. And then the UK government has a small funding body, which is a bit like the National Science Foundation mm -hmm. in the States. And I was very grateful for their support. And so like that, there have been little bits of support financially. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing was like the platform was solid. Mm -hmm. So a well-found lab. So like around this lab, even though it's old, I'll have a few things. Yeah. Like a few machines to measure fluorescence basically and a microscope to do that and things. So those came from government sources at various times. Yeah. So very much like the NSF system, we'd write a grant proposal and hope for the best and occasionally it's funded. But it didn't matter when even the funding didn't arise in a given couple of years. So I never felt that pressure, mm. honestly, mm. because life had more complexities <laughs> here. So as long as there were young people who were willing to come and give three years of the prime of their lives, I've never forgotten that. They had the whole world at their feet then. And they suddenly say, if hey, I'm going to come and spend three years with you. Mm -hmm. How lucky am I? And that was it, you know. So I think that energy, I think, carried us through in many cases. And as you see, most of the time, Pambir, we are trying to do proof of principle, really. Yeah. And when we come from the philosophical position, then we can demonstrate it with the minimum requirement. So like and logic, we made a molecule with two holes in it to catch two different atoms. And then we sing Tina Turner really loud and hope it works. And that's what happened. So that because of that, our research is not sophisticated technically. Yeah. I hope it has some level of value in the philosophical position. So to realize, like to talk to a molecule, you have to think of it as a ghost and like that. So once you do that, then you can minimize the requirement of technicality. So that's how I've survived so long, I think. Well, we hope you to continue to survive a lot longer. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Honestly, we could have stayed here for much, much longer to keep talking. You have a wedding to go to. Yes, we do right have a wedding to go to, unfortunately. But yes, so thank you again for, for sharing your time with us and your lab and your efforts. Absolute pleasure. Thank you both, David and Fabio. Thank you. The best idea as I had was under a coconut tree in the middle of a civil war. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be dirt in the normal definition, but this is dirt in the sense of soil. I mm. sitting there, and this was a time when I was also one of the principal carers for my grandmother. So, you would think that is the most unsuitable situation to have science discovery, mm -hmm. a full-blown war, and a ill person who I dearly loved, who needed to be looked after, and then in the surroundings which is resource poor by most definitions. And out of that came everything I spoke to you today. And so, if that's dirt, God give me more. <laughs>You've been listening to Two Scientists, directed, edited and hosted by me, Pamve Bahia, and co-produced with David Basanta Gudira. We recorded this episode in AP's lab at Queen's University, Belfast. One of the things we didn't talk about during the episode was AP's love for drums, and in particular, Irish percussion. While he plays in a band himself, the track featured here is courtesy of his friends, from the aptly titled album, Old Friends. Check out our website to find out more about them. Finally, relating to the wedding we ran to immediately after this recording, congratulations once again to our dear friend Arturo and his beautiful bride Rachel. We thank you both so much for having us.